Speaking about communists, let's talk about the Conservative Party <laughs> conference. Because it turns out there are some commies there for some reason. Much conservatism. So Carrie Johnson, Boris Johnson's wife and not an elected politician or anyone of any note other than the fact that she sleeps with Boris Johnson, uh, gave a speech there about extending gay rights. Is there a right that a gay person ha doesn't have that I, I have? I can't. They can get married. They can, like, you know, live. But that's Get but, jobs. I mean, that equates to equal recognition, yeah. isn't it? I, I thought that we had the same rights, but apparently these rights need to be extended, so let's uh, listen to a clip from Carrie's speech. It's not this one, it's the other one. God, you're not on your game today, John, are you? It's not this one either. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. It is really fantastic to be here. Um, I want to start by saying that I think that the whole thing about gender equality is really important. Um, and it's and acceptance for everyone, whoever you are and whomever you love. There are still those that will tell you that being LGBT plus notori is somehow incompatible. Well, looking around the room tonight, we can see that is blatantly untrue. <laughs> the idea that your sexual orientation or your gender identity should determine your politics is now as logical as saying as your height or your hair colour should. Many of you here tonight have helped play a part in the journey our party has taken on gay rights. And we can now say with huge pride that it was a Conservative Prime Minister who delivered equal marriage in yeah. the new way. Yeah. And I want you all to know that we now have a Prime Minister who is completely committed to protecting those gains Good. and yeah. extending yeah. the further. But for all the progress we have made as a society, we know there is still a long way to go. The LGBT plus community still faces stigma, harassment and discrimination, with hate crime still a fact of life. I heard myself on the victim of such a crime at the Pride reception we held in Downing Street earlier this year, and I have to say I was moved to tears. I did think he was going to do a Trudeau there. Which nearly tripped over the uh, the LGBT. Bit. Nearly, but I mean, how conservative did that sound to you? It's almost. Um, it sounds like a Labour Party conference. Speech. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Doesn't it? It's you, you can't differentiate the two. We're at for all. equality. We're for progress. That's right. We're conservative. So she used exactly the same buzzwords yes. as the Labour Party, and all of needless to say, all of the progressives. Yeah, it's all it's saturated in left wing ideology. Uh, the fact that she can, she's saying, well. Uh, your your politics no longer determine uh, your your sexuality no longer determines your politics. Who said it did? Well, the left when they try to create identity categories that are politicized along certain kinds of lines. They they're deliberately trying to gain control of the you know gay voting bloc, the, the lesbian voting bloc, and they're trying to squeeze these all together in the acronym LGBT, which uh, we can talk about in a minute. But um, the, so the the whole thing there, like the again the progress the um. You know, equality. This is the language of the communist. That's what they're after. They think that there is a glorious future ahead of us that we can attain if only we level the playing field enough until everything is exactly the same. Uh, that is the opposite of conservatism, mm. which is to protect and conserve, dare I say, those things we have inherited from the past, which were not the product of progress, they were the product of tradition. Mm. So the, the total opposite and subversion of the Conservative Party, right there, from an unelected person who happens to be sleeping with the Prime Minister. Anyway, so where does LGBT come from? Because the first thing she says, oh, they're saying you can't be LGBT in a Tory. It's like, well, I mean, it's like, you know, well, what, what does it mean? Where does it come from? What is it? Well, as Wikipedia tells us, it's been use, in use since the 1990s. Uh, the initialism, as well as some of its common variants, functions as an umbrella term for sexuality and gender identity. And they link to a study as their first link there. So if we can get to the next one, this is what they link to. Uh, the approaches to research and intersectionality perspectives on L gender, LGBT, and racial ethnic identities. And in the abstract, they point out that intersectionality theories, or the recognition of multiple interlocking identities, defined by relative socio-cultural power and privilege, 
sounding very conservative, this, isn't it? Oh, very. Uh, constitute a vital step forward in research among multiple domains of inquiry. To provide common ground for this work, each paper in this special issue addresses the intersections of gender, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, and racial, ethnic identities and related experiences. In this introduction, we provide an overview of the definitions, conceptualizations, etc., etc., and they go into the history of it. And so, where does this all come from? Well, this all comes from Kimberly Crenshaw. Do you know who she is? No idea. She is one of the uh, prime movers of critical race theory, and she is the lady who coined the term intersectionality in her 1989 paper, quote, uh, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racial, Anti-Racist Politics. Much conservatism. Needless to say, this is the exact abstract universalism that aspires to, um, or, or, or at least um, <laughs> justifies the dissolving of the institutions that conservatives wish Absolutely. to preserve, not defend them in virtue of progress. Absolutely. That, that, and that's exactly right. Abstract universalism, which is exactly where we've arrived here, in contrast to concrete particularism, mm -hmm. which is what the conservatives are supposed to be, preserving these demonstrable you know unique institutions that are not universal that are particular to our country and so in this essay right um i've read through it in this essay she maps through three legal cases in america that she feels that black women uh, are entitled to a particular identity claim that is not recognized by the american legal system this is the origin point of intersectionality a black and a capital b black so a racial identitarian a gender identitarian and a communist trying to achieve, quote, equality uh, by manipulation of U.S. law has found its way into being LGBT and a Tory. They are not the same thing. They're contradictory things. You cannot be LGBT. But this is not the same as saying, can you be gay and a Tory? Because no. LGBT is an acronym, a, a sort of a Frankenstein's monster of an acronym. Because obviously LG and B are sexualities and T is a gender identity. Not the same thing. Why are they together? Doesn't make sense. Only makes sense if you're interested in coalition building, left-wing politics, which Kimberly Crenshaw is, and if you're intersectional. If you're not intersectional, you can't be LGBT. If you're a Tory, why are you intersectional? Because you're now critiquing the intersections of racial and gender hierarchies and trying to achieve equality. Is that what conservatives are about? I wouldn't have said so. But uh, basically what she's saying is, if you can be an LGBT and a Tory, you can say, I'm a communist and a conservative at the same time. No. No, you can't. And so Pink News were thrilled with this, and Pink News being like a you know, leftist subversive rag, as you can imagine, they're thrilled with this. And if, the cons if Pink News are thrilled with what's going on at the Conservative Party conference, you're doing something wrong. You're not being very conservative, right? So they say, in a speech at the Conservative Party conference, Pride drinks reception. Why would there be a Pride? Pride is a sin, isn't it? Isn't Pride a sin in the Conservative worldview? I thought it was, you know, there, there are seven deadly sins, pride being one of them. Are you going to have a wrath conference next? <laughs> Call me old-fashioned. Anyway, Carrie Johnson insisted that it was blatantly untrue and incompatible to be queer and a Tory. Uh, Johnson said her husband, the Prime Minister Boris, was completely committed to LGBT rights at the Pride event uh, with partnership with Stonewall at the Midland Hotel. Do you know who Stonewall are? I have some idea. Radical left-wing gay activist group. Hmm. Looking for communism. Very conservative. Speaking to an audience of around 100, including her husband and women and equalities minister Liz Truss, who we'll get onto in a minute, uh, she said, you know, there are still those who, so she said. Uh, and so, just to be clear, being LGBT, as in uh, identifying with an acronym, and being a homosexual are not the same thing. Uh, there is actually a conservative tradition of homosexuals, but this isn't it. And uh, she's conflating being gay with being a left-wing activist, which is precisely what identity politicians want. Mm. The Conservatives have completely blundered into all of these things, and that's why they lose every battle with the left. They've, they, they've actually just sleepwalked into the process of reification that the left are trying. Yes, they have. Yeah. That's exactly what they... No, that's exactly it. And they can't even understand why that would be bad. That's the thing. The worst part about it. The Conservatives are so out to lunch that they have no it's idea. It's because they have absolutely no sight of what they're trying to conserve. No. Because if they did, they would notice that, that, that this entire framework only works um, in complete opposition to the very to those yeah. very things which 
British Conservatives see value in. Yes. I mean, things like, I don't know, the um, the nuclear family, the mm. bourgeois family, as Marxists would put it, yeah. and the patriarchal structure, as feminists put it, as intersectionists yeah. put it, which stands over and above what it regards as true human freedoms. If you're going yeah. to legitimise all of those things, of which, as we know, are politicised, you can't possibly be advocating for a Conservative position. No. And, it, and the, the entire point of them, as Crenshaw herself notes in Critical Race Theory, Key Writings That Form the Movement, is to critique and change at once. So the very purpose of looking at things through this lens is to deconstruct. Not very conservative. Anyway, what do I know? So uh, moving on, this has led us into Cervixgate. Cervixgate. We're following Cervixgate... It's the, the, for like three weeks now, the political mm. class of this country has been gripped by the question, do women have a cervix? And it's been embarrassing watching them, again, fumble around in this nightmare void where they have no idea. And this is Boris's response. Oh, God. OK. And just finally, Keir Starmer, of course, said last week that it's not right to say that only women have a cervix. Do you agree? No, what I, what I think about this is that... Uh, Biology is very is very important, but we've 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 got a system now in our country for many many years in which people are allowed to uh, people can 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 uh, change gender. We help them uh, to do that. And what I absolutely passionately uh, believe, and I've uh, fought for this for a long time, is everybody should be treated with dignity and respect. And that's what I. So so what what would you say to a to someone who identifies as a woman but doesn't have a certain... I would say everybody needs to be treated with dignity and respect, and that's, that's my strong... So opinion. Boris doesn't think that women have a cervix. In short, yeah. In short, he, he, like, but you can see he's just parroting Carrie's position on this, the left-wing mm -hmm. position, because he just doesn't want to get into it because he doesn't know. Yeah. He doesn't know what he should yeah. be saying. He thinks that arbitrary decisions are more scientific than biology. Yeah. And okay. but but moreover, this this hits at the problem at the heart of the issue, which happens to actually be what is the definition of a woman? Is it adult human female, which is the essential definition that speaks to biological characteristics, or is it nothing at all? Anyone who identifies as such. That's the point. Mm. And Boris has been like, well, yeah, well, I mean, no one's disagreeing with it. You know, people should be treated with dignity. Yeah, everyone agrees that people should be treated with dignity. But the question is, what is a woman, Boris? And you're like, well, I don't have an answer. Uh, and so, yeah, the, like, you know, do we have a, a, an, an identity that's grounded in concrete reality or the sort of floating abstract definitions of self-identity? Uh, the alternative, though, is Liz Truss, who happens to be the Women in Equalities Minister, and she is definitely very much a conservative. So, God willing, maybe she'll gain control of the Conservative Party from Boris somehow, because she thinks that women have vaginas. She had to say this on the, on the radio. They have vaginas. Radical. I know. Absolutely. <laughs> this, but this is the insane place that we're at here. Mm. Uh, this at the time caused a massive furor about the very concept. Because how dare you say that all of these men in dresses are not women. And she was like, well, they don't have cervixes, do they? Uh, but anyway, so just a quick aside on this. It's nice that she's in charge of... The Women's and Equalities Commission, uh, because if we can go to the next one, John, um, she uh, she's apparently recently signed off on a massive 183 million pound cut to women's and equalities aid as in her first week as foreign secretary. So you can see that she's just not having any of this left wing nonsense, and she we're not sending hundreds of millions of pounds overseas for women and equalities in other countries. Uh, this uh, there was the the budget was 308 million. And she's cut it to 125 million, so then 183 million. And uh, hopefully she'll get rid of the rest of it soon. Because I don't want them sending our money because Pakistan needs those gender studies programs. Just not interested, sorry. Uh, as you can imagine, this didn't go down very well with the left. Liberal Democrat spokesperson for equalities, Vera, oh, sorry, Vera Hobhouse, said, How can the Minister for Women and Equalities be pushing forward such a huge and cruel cut, which will damage the prospects of millions of vulnerable women and girls? This is utterly unacceptable. Trust has a clear choice. If she wants to press ahead with the cut, she must resign as Women and Equalities Minister. Well, if she did that, she probably wouldn't get the cut, so she probably shouldn't do that. But uh, I find it very interesting how this is a distinctly imperial mindset, isn't it? Mm. You know, Britain should be sorting out things around the world. I thought we gave up the empire. Yeah. You know, thought we thought we weren't in charge of these foreign countries. Well, thought, now. More to the point, export, ex, well, exporting infrastructure was a form of colonialism to some. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does feel like a really gross colonial project that the mm. Imperial Dem- uh, sorry, Imperial Democrats. It's not a bad term for them, actually. The the, no, the, the the Liberal Democrats, the Universalists, have got in their heads where we should be interfering with native traditions all around the world. I don't think we should. That's definitely colonialism. But anyway, moving on. Liz Truss definitely has views on uh, whether women have cervixes. Uh, she at least is in favour of the idea that they do. I mean, she agrees with Labour MP Rosie Duffield that only women have a cervix. A reactionary. But, uh, but she uh, she's not unsympathetic to helping trans people, though. That's the thing, right? There's there's one thing saying, well, look, you know, we have a specific essential definition of what a woman is, but there is also, well, we recognise that some people have problems, right? That some people are in a position where they don't happen to fit neatly into either category, and so those people shouldn't be, you know, cast out into the wilderness we don't want to hurt them you know we get you know you want you want to be sympathetic and so she's uh said that trans people shouldn't be able to declare their own identity but uh should have some sort of you know medical checks and like because you want as, as she put puts it checks and balances on this mm-hmm. um because she said that at the conservative party conference you see the absurdity of identity politics last week at the labor conference presumably she watched callum's clip shows um which ended up saying that women don't have cervixes or whatever. Uh, Rosie Duffield is right that women have cervixes, but more than that, she's also right to be able to express her view, uh, and obviously we want open, honest debate. And she thinks this is a huge problem for British politics, and she is actually right. And it's infesting her own party. It's completely taken over the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, and so it's just like reform, reclaim, and UKIP outside of the Conservative Party and like a large chunk of the Conservative Party that have moved to the left uh, on this because, again, they don't understand what's going on. And so we can ask, say, famous libertarian MP Steve Baker what he thinks of the Conservative Party. And uh, as Maya Artusi points out, when asked whether the Conservative government is Conservative, Steve Baker says, no, I'm afraid we're socialist now. Even their own MPs can see that they're socialist. I mean, there was, a, there was an example of a week or two ago where one Conservative MP had apparently been reported to go home crying to his wife, crying, literally, literally crying, that he didn't know what a Tory was anymore. The absolute state of it. It's disgusting. Like, give Liz Truss control over the party and allow her to just get rid of all this left-wing nonsense. It is worth remembering that she was a Liberal Democrat herself once as well, yeah, wasn't but- she? Clearly, she's uh, had a change of heart. I mean, you used to be a Bolshevik. No, that's you know? that's, so, you that's know, a fair point. And, and now she's currently, uh, you know, putting her knee on the neck of the leftists in the Conservative Party. So, you know, uh, people change. People, uh, people, uh, you know, get this. And an example of this is, of course, you know, the party of low taxation, says Boris, as they raise taxes. Just the point being, you can't serve two masters. Right. And you'll find yourself being pushed into necessity by doing the bidding of socialists and the conservatives are trapped in this paradigm and can't find their way out. Mm. If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast, The Lotus Eaters, you can catch the full podcast at 1 p.m. every weekday UK time at lotuseaters.com. You can also sign up at lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site. Yeah, that's how we keep this whole operation running. And recently we've put up loads of great stuff, such as this interview with legendary comedian Steve Hughes, one of my personal favourite comedians. So it was a real honour to be able to meet him. But what one thing that I didn't expect that he would be such a deep thinker, and this, honestly, this podcast is genuinely, like, a meeting of minds in a way. He was right on my wavelength on a bunch of things and helped me actually connect a bunch of dots, but I'm not going to carry on and spoil it. Uh, we also, of course, have lots of interesting articles that have been written, uh, such as this one by Josh about the dumbest country on earth. And for premium, uh, for silver tier subscribers, uh, we also include a link. So it's uh, we have an audio reading of it from a chap called Jonathan, who has a very smooth voice that uh, you will enjoy. And this is great because often I don't have time to read all of the articles that we put up because we've put up a lot of regular content. And so this saves me the hassle of having to read it myself. So I really actually am very appreciative of this feature on a personal level. But uh, we also do the contemplations and epochs, which are just interesting podcasts about interesting things. These are regular weekly podcasts. So this one is uh, one of our writers, Josh, who's a very, he's got a master's degree in psychology, talking about theories of intelligence and how they matter. And uh, of course, we've got the epochs where we, myself and Bo, or in this case, it was Josh and Bo, talking about the life of Sir Francis Drake. So that's two solid hours uh, talking about England's most notorious adventurer. Uh, but we've also got lots and lots of other ones. This is number 21. So there's a, a 
good back catalogue there. And finally, we have our book clubs. And this is the part that I'm most proud of. Uh, recently, we've done uh, Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell. And, and Reflections on a Ravaged Century by Robert Conquest. Yeah, Robert Conquest is fantastic. Just if you want Western chauvinist historian, he's your man. Anti-socialism. Yes, <laughs> in, in, in all forms. It's fantastic. Uh, so yeah, and yeah. like I said, that's what keeps the podcast running. So if you want to become a member, thank you very much. And we think there's some great stuff you'll enjoy.